Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, the topic is misleading and false information online and what can be done to stop it. Josh Sharfstein speaks to Clint Watts and Rachel Chernosky of Maburo, a digital consulting company that focuses on misinformation and extremism. Let's listen. Clint Watts and Rachel Chernosky, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health on Call to talk about misinformation. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I want to start uh, with you, Clint, um, with a general question. What is going on with misinformation in the world today? And I mean a general question. Yes. I think there's two things to think about it. One is the system by which you're delivering misinformation. And the second is people's uh, cognitive vulnerabilities to misinformation. And it's kind of two parts. And COVID-19 and the pandemic all the way up to now with vaccines is a perfect storm in the sense that people went to social media, the internet, to devices for information like they'd never gone before, and they were extremely isolated. We literally told everybody, go to your house and get information online. And so that creates a network by which there is essentially extreme confusion. If you rewind 20 years ago, before the internet had really taken off and and social media had proliferated, most people got their news from at most uh, 30 to at top 60 minutes of news that was delivered through a filter, which were mainstream news channels and and public health officials or, or the CDC or the White House. Today, there is nearly an infinite number of sources of information about COVID-19 and the vaccines, and yet very few people know much of anything about COVID-19 or the vaccines. So there's an availability sort of problem with information. That's part of the algorithm, that's part of the system. On the psychological side, which is the humans, when you're afraid, you tend to believe things that you wouldn't otherwise believe. It's just a psychological phenomenon. You start to take in more information because you're in a protection mode. But also with social media and the internet, what people don't realize is they tend to believe that which they see first and that which they see most, which is the tradition. But now you're seeing that which you see first and most come not from public health experts, but from friends, family, people of the social media tribe of the user. And so that creates this bias where people implicitly trust that information is equal or better to an unknown expert. And this sort of storm that comes together just confounds everything to where it's hard for people to know essentially what's happening. The last part I shouldn't overlook is never has anyone in the history of time been able to be a printing press, an audio studio, and their own TV studio from their own phone. And that just creates such an enormous availability of information on any topic in the world. So you've got this mechanism for misinformation and increased vulnerability to misinformation happening at the same time. Who's behind it? Who are the main sources of you know people saying the vaccine is a conspiracy to track people or or, or things that are um, just in general just flatly wrong? I mean, where does this come from? Josh, it's a collision of many different actors that all amplify each other. Uh, this would have been impossible before social media. You could not get. Uh, anti-vaccine groups maybe in California where there's been traditional anti-vax movement to suddenly be saying or amplifying the same thing that say Russia, which is a known purveyor of of foreign disinformation into the United States, that's also undermining people's understandings of what the COVID-19 pandemic was about and also the effectiveness of vaccines. When you look across that landscape, you have lots of activist groups, and those activist groups have, have been very passionate, and the loudest voice tends to draw, draw the most followers over time. That's just sort of the nature of social media. But separately, you have nation states, which are in a what we call a, 
an information battle around the world around really two key things. One, where did COVID-19 come from? Was it in China or not in China? Uh, and the second part is whose vaccines are effective and can they be trusted? Add to that the corporate manipulation services that are out there where you have corporate competition between different vaccine makers. Uh, you have uh, political groups that are using the pandemic or vaccines as some sort of a lever to mobilize their supporters and audiences. Put all four of those you know, groups together and you have a cacophony of noise where not only is it difficult to figure out what the truth is, it's also difficult to figure out which of those actors created the conspiracy first and which is just amplifying it. Wow. And and I do want to talk very specifically with Rachel about some of these conspiracies, but one one more question for you. How do people who want to misinform others go about it? Like, what is their playbook look like? So in those categories I mentioned, Josh, when you're when you're looking at how misinformation is created, um, there's really two sort of sub segments. And this is the important distinction between misinformation and disinformation. Uh, misinformation being information that is incorrect, but there is it is not known to the purveyor. They actually believe in it. They they believe in incorrect information and spread it versus disinformation, which are actors which deliberately know it's false or manipulated information and are spreading it for some sort of political or social objective. Those would be nation states like Russia or, or China. But in each of these, I think there's key things, which is one, use a kernel of truth. Uh, if you can tie your lie uh, to some sort of kernel of truth, whatever that misinformation is, it gives some sort of appeal or look of real information or true information. So it's to be setting up false studies or citing anecdotes instead of statistics over time. The next part is just being able to move very, very quickly. Uh, those that move first with misinformation then put fact checkers and, and knowledgeable experts in a rearward position where they're catching up. They're trying to catch up about what the truth is. And, and that's much more difficult to overcome. Uh, if you're not out there first, then you're fighting uphill. And I think the last part is amplification and sustainment. We often think, hey, if we tell somebody the truth once, they just need to believe it. And you'll hear uh, oftentimes experts and scientists or public officials say, look, I already told you that's not true. This is what the truth is. And they get worn down. They, they literally get worn down. So whoever can maintain the tenacity to push uh, whatever their conspiracy is to incite, you know, sort of misleading information wins over time. And that's just literally about, can I keep up the narrative as long as possible? That is a sobering picture. I, I want to turn to you, Rachel, because I know you have been looking at the impact of misinformation, disinformation in public health and for the pandemic. What are the salient aspects of this challenge that, that you see? Yeah, so I think there's two things. One is that there are, you know, prolific conspiracies that are just demonstrably false. Um, conspiracies like saying the pandemic was planned or, you know, there are microchips in the vaccines. Um, but I think the more um, insidious part of it, of mis and disinformation around COVID-19 specifically uh, is manipulated information. So the VAERS data system being one uh, good example of this data that is real, but is then manipulated in the information space to portray, you know, a false image of what's really going on in terms of COVID-19 deaths, hospitalizations, how many people have had, um, you know, severe side effects to vaccines. Um, there, are, there are real studies or, or data systems like that that can be easily manipulated by, you know, people wanting to spread mis and disinformation um, that, that really hit home with audiences if they don't do all of the legwork that it takes to debunk that sort of stuff. And that's really hard for the average person to, to have the time to do that. Right. So there may be a website that says there have been a certain number of deaths for example, reported after vaccination, that website was never intended to say that the deaths were caused by vaccination. But because it's a government website, for example, that has that, then a whole narrative gets put around that. I am latching on to your example here because just yesterday I was talking to a lot of people um, about vaccination and um, this, very, this very issue came up. Yeah, that's exactly right. I want to... Um, 
focus for a second on public health officials themselves, because this has been an extraordinary um, experience for many officials who, you know, really aren't seeking the limelight when they choose public health as a career, but suddenly find themselves, you know, in the, a very harsh spotlight with a lot of um, lies being spread about them and, you know, people harassing and threatening them. What is happening to them and who is behind it? So I think there's a couple things to look at, Josh. What, one is what is natural local sort of angst? I, I can't stress this enough, and I want to try and avoid the politics, but when you have elected officials essentially countering facts, uh, creating an alternative reality about the truth, they tend to point to someone else as being responsible for whatever the grievance is. Mask, vaccine mandates, those are two of them that just stick out immediately. And so ultimately, it's elected officials for political gain oftentimes that are pointing their supporters towards this sort of enemy, uh, you know, that they declared. Separately from that, it, there's a lot of, you know, political challengers oftentimes in these local elections or local races. And they want to be able to, this is where it really ties into larger issues. They don't want to just challenge a school board about a vaccine mandate. They want to challenge the entire system and replace it. And this is, if you can overwhelm elected officials and install your own people, then you can control the outcome potentially of the vote. If you can overwhelm the medical and health system and their experts, you can control people's perceptions around what is safety. These things aren't always logical either. I think that's one of the things I found most remarkable in the last year. While you've only recently seen a pivot by some elected officials a year ago who are very anti-vaccine or very anti-mask mandated, over time, there's a reality horizon that people crash into. You don't have a vaccine, you're more likely to die, you know, exponentially more likely. And so how do they wrestle with the truth when it's right in front of your face? Um, what is yet to be seen, I think, is in the case of, you know, vaccine clinics, um, vaccine distributors, people doing public health, is will there be a point where people realize that it is in their best interest to follow those rules and that those people are ultimately there for the good of society? I think in most places it is, but we do see these hyper-partisan flashpoints around the country that are quite unnerving. And Rachel, how does misinformation about COVID play into that harassment and, um, you know, just very unusual and unfortunate environment for people who are trying to lead through the pandemic? Yeah, I think that anti-government, the sort of anti-elite sentiment is um, prolific among conspiracy theories at large. So, you know, it used to be 9-11 conspiracies, now it's COVID, and public health officials just happen to be the people that are, you know, doing the, the public statements, the debunking of false information. And so they end up being, you know, the targets of that. But really, this sort of sentiment is long been part of many, you know, conspiracies and misinformation campaigns. Um, it just so happens that this time it's around a pandemic. In other words, it's not necessarily personal. It's just kind of conspiracy business. Yeah, that's right. I want to ask you both um, what can be done. Um, and I realize that there's no simple fix at this point, but what would be maybe, let's start with what people who are in the middle of all this can do. And then I'll ask you about broader policy solutions. You know, there, there are a lot of people that I talk to in the field of public health who are really at a loss. They expected to go into a fact-based field and they're, you know, unsure of how they can convince anyone of anything given the misinformation out there. What would you tell them, Clint? Josh, I think there's a few things to think about is watch what uh, the misinformation and disinformation peddlers do, and then use what they do as tips and tricks for you working with experts who are advancing science to push back against sort of that, what I call an information rebellion, right? An alternative reality. One thing is you have to sustain and it's hard and tiring. That's why you're the lone expert. We have experts because they're the ones that have accomplished this in a field but they have to sustain the messaging over time. So how do we do that, right? Like how do we consistently put out that rebuttal to that narrative? That's a big part of it. And I think that comes down to networks. If you watch the most sophisticated um, manipulators of information, they have a very strong network and they sustain it over an extended duration. 
which would mean that we would need to do that too to advance truth or essentially is what I say, take, take truth on offense. You would have to have a network uh, of experts that rather than being alone in terms of their messaging can amplify each other's messaging. It's a lot less exhausting when you can take information from you know a, a, another uh, person who's in the ranks with you and, and amplify that as long as as well as your own message. It also makes you just look bigger in terms of support for your evidence. I think the last thing to remember is people trust information on social media because it comes from people that look like like them and talk like them. And so it's extremely important when we look at experts, right? They all look like doctors or public health officials, but that's not who we see every single day. It's not who we trust. So that's local doctors, it's local public officials, and it's also influencers in those communities and in those groups that can speak to what their own personal experience is. I think the last thing is elevating the stories of formers, meaning those that were resistant to the vaccine that died from it, those that were resistant to the vaccine that were very sick from it and wish they had, and those that took the vaccine in the local community and it helped save their life. Those are the most powerful messengers. You, you can probably remember back to ads against smoking, the most powerful messages always came from former smokers and, and they can speak to the consequences of their actions. Got it. Rachel, anything that you'd like to add? Any examples, for, for, for instance, of successful or at least somewhat successful pushing back against misinformation? Yeah, I think it's uh, to what Clint was saying, being patient, um, but also coming up with creative ways to provide the truth. So, you know, not everybody is going to click on the fact checking article. Are there ways that we can visually represent how effective vaccines are or how dangerous COVID could be? Um, Other ways to spread information on social media that speak to, you know, a short attention span, someone scrolling through a timeline. Um, and, and maybe that's influencers or, or, you know, like I said, visual representations, but other ways to get the information to people beyond asking them to go read a long news article or, um, you know, click on a fact-checking website that they may not want or otherwise visit. What about humor? Does humor play a role in this at all? Josh, I think it does, but the problem with humor in a health situation is you're almost always talking about people who are severely ill or dying, right? So it's a little bit complicated. I think if it's done right, particularly right, and if I had one example, uh, someone who who I do know is Jordan Klepper uh, of uh, The Daily Show, he's done kind of the man on the street encounters with anti-vax audiences or or mask mandate audiences, and he's particularly effective. He's, but he's a he's an experienced veteran of that approach. So you have to be careful, you know, when you do those things that you're walking in with the right sort of attitude and to be open and listening and also kind of cut through the noise in just the right way. But I do think it is is super effective. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about how the Food and Drug Administration responded to people using ivermectin with a tweet that said, come on, you're not a horse or a cow, something like that. A very good example. Yeah, yeah, that's an appropriate time. And I think part of that is you're not talking about people suffering. You know, you're you're trying to essentially help them uh, not hurt themselves. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a preemptive. So I think that's a perfect example when you can look to a mechanism like that. I would say one thing to, you know, be aware of if you're trying to use humor as, a, as an effective tool is that you don't want the audience who needs to you know, intake this information to feel like they're being mocked, um, which, you know, comes back to, I think, doctors and and the public health officials who are going to speak to people who may be vaccine hesitant or skeptical. Um, It requires patients to, you know, get through all of the misinformation, but people have valid concerns and uh, you need to take the time to, you know, cut through that stuff. Fair enough. Um, Final question to you both. What can society do? to reduce the pressure on public health officials and support the response to this pandemic? Are there policies? Are there laws? What what needs to be put into place to to make some of this stop? One of the big discoveries, I think, both during the COVID-19 outbreak and now with vaccines is how important it is to resource our local governments and officials and and medical uh, facilities over time. 
we tend to look to the national level to solve problems, you know, because we have this sort of media environment, which has convinced us that one single person, the president suddenly is going to turn everything around, you know, all over the country. And that's not true. And I think for local officials, it's understanding how empowered um, dissenters are (laughs) of truth um, at a local level. And that's what you see today, whether it's, Uh, vaccine distribution point, which we had one right here in New York City, just down the street from us that was uh, attacked, what was it, last Friday. Uh, The the idea that at your local community, an uprising can be mobilized against an election official vaccine (laughs) testing place, school boards. We need to take it a little bit more seriously and how how do we help empower them with their networks um, to restore confidence in their local communities. And they're also probably the best at it. They're known oftentimes to the, to the people that are kind of resistant to what the truth and science is saying. I, I think focusing kind of at the local level and integrating it nationally is more important than trying to roll out a giant program from the national level. So it's, it's going to take a very different approach than what we're used to. Rachel, what about Facebook, Twitter, social media companies themselves? Do they have responsibility here? Yeah, certainly they have responsibility and obviously social media at large dealing with mis- and disinformation is a work in progress. Um, some of the suggestions that came up to, you know, this week with the, the Facebook whistleblower were, can we change the news feed to be a chronological timeline? I think small tweaks like that can be helpful uh, when it comes to public health information, Um, but also, you know, to their credit, they've done a lot to promote fact-checking organizations, partner with those organizations to help make sure that what they're uh, amplifying is correct information and the most up-to-date science. So it's a work in progress, but certainly they have responsibility to, to keep doing better. Great. Well, I really want to thank both of you for for coming to join me on the podcast. This is a fascinating topic, and we may want to check back in with you at some point in the in the future. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thanks, Josh, and sign us up next time you need us. We'll be here. Thanks so much. Public Health on Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo, social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.